Welcome everybody to Yala, the first episode of Yala. And our first guest today is uh, Daniel Mate. Uh, but first we want to begin with uh, Elik uh, performing uh, a song and then we'll start uh, the conversation. So Elik, go for it. All right. Hey, Jewish brother. the other hey, Jewish brother how does it feel not to care about the other every day they're being bombed one hour Because for you they're just a number Because for you they're just a number Hey Jewish brother How does it feel Not to care about the other Woo! Kola right. Kavod! Okay! Yeah. I, have a, I have a name for your group, Alex and Chains. Alex and Chains. <laughs> so let's start uh, for real now. Uh, okay, so... Um, Hi, everyone. Hello, everyone. Welcome, everybody, and welcome especially to uh, Daniel Mate, who's uh, our first guest on the new uh, uh, podcast, Yala. Uh, bless you, Daniel. And... Uh, um, okay, so... Uh, Daniel, do you have anything to say just before we start with uh, with some questions and uh, start the conversation? Well, just that I'm super, uh, super stoked to be your first guest. What an honor to kick this thing off. I'm glad you guys are doing this. You know, I love your conversations between the two of you. And um, I loved having you on my Instagram live. And it's just such a thrill to to, you know, be batting lead off. Mm -hmm. uh in in the guest chair um i am really grateful for the invitation yeah thank you for coming yeah thank you so much we 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 are both uh really really hyped for this uh we know the situation is uh is very dire uh but still we we need to uh find like the energy to do as best as we can to uh to help the situation become better and being excited about doing good things i think is a is a good thing yeah, and I think, uh, you know, whatever solution, I don't know if there is a solution, but the path forward is going to have to be relational. And th there's so much sustenance right now. Like social media has never been more useful, mm -hmm. to me at least, in yeah. terms of keeping a sense of a real connection to people. Because now it's not optional. We have to stay connected. We have to enjoy each other. We have to remember what humanity is about. We have to we have to stay free. In other words, if we want to free, free Palestine or free, free that land from occupation, we have to de-isolate ourselves and we have to have freedom to give. And, uh, and it's just important to, it's not so much important to it in a, in an escapist way to enjoy ourselves, but to keep joy alive. I think it's really important. So the way you guys do it, I really respect with, you know, tough talk, just telling the truth, but um, you know when there are smiles to be had, mm -hmm. uh, you you guys are able to bring that that lightness of spirit that I think is necessary to lift people. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and I think it really connects, like it connects to all the conversation on the all the topics that we wanted to talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, strangely, um, but uh, so the first topic I want to. Uh, 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 raise some question, but uh, then Alec, uh, you have uh, something that you want to say before we start, right? But I'll just raise the topic. The topic is like, how can we use art, uh, art in the broader sense of the word? Uh, it includes music, it includes uh, visual art, it, it includes uh, uh, even uh, like podcasts, I consider a type of art. Um, 
how can we use it uh, to uh, achieve a, a future of, uh, of peace, of uh, justice, of freedom uh, here between the river and the sea uh, in all social struggles. Uh, so that is the first topic that we want to talk about. But first, uh, Eric, please uh, say what uh, you wanted to say to begin. Uh, yeah, that's. I thought that it's important to say, just like kind of for the historical record, you know, that it's we're recording this here and now we're in Tel Aviv. It's mm -hmm. like what I was singing that every day they're getting bombed one hour away from your home. Like it's really happening right, right now. now. Right now. Yeah, and we're recording it in the midst of this still happening. And like every day, I don't know how to wrap my mind around the fact that I know that it's happening. And I feel as that like there are huge forces that trying to make me get used to it, you know, to normalize it and just ignore it. And, and it's every day like a struggle. And, and I, when it started, I just stopped doing art, like, you know, and like doing political songs is kind of new things to, to me. And I wonder, and then I understood that I have to relate to this in my, in my work, but I wonder how do you approach this uh, issue? Wow, I mean that's a great question. It's an important one. Um, before I answer it, your your question itself brings to mind a quote from uh, a friend of mine who's also a teacher, one of my favorite writers, named Stephen Jenkinson, a Canadian author. Um, and he he writes this about art. He says we're talking about the function of art here, and he's distinguishing this from art as like self expression, like the individual expressing themselves which I've always really related to because I've got this kind of, I'm such an individual, I'm so, my, my psychology is so unique, I've got these issues, I want to express them in my own unique way. Bob Dylan, Joni Mitchell, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the great actors going deep inside themselves. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. But in times like this, it seems inadequate to the moment, you know? So he says this, it seems to me that art is fundamentally prismatic, meaning... You know how a prism works. It takes something that's allegedly transparent, like light, and when passed through a prism out the other side, its constituent parts become available to you in a spectrum of colors. So if you think of cultural life as that light, when you pass it through the filter of art making, what will come out the side, excuse me, what will come out the other side is not telling you everything's going to be okay. Instead, you can begin to recognize the culture in all of its dynamics. You'll want to know the rest of the story not just the part that benefits you mm. that's the mark of citizenship mm. so that's yeah. a that's that's an understanding of art that's more than just about how can my particular genius or talent uh express itself which is always going to be tied to ego um and brings in this element of cultural obligation or responsibility or collective um mandate you know that that we we, we belong to a bigger picture and that what we're doing as artists is a kind of work to uh, excavate things and, and illuminate things and crystallize things. Um, so that's the philosophy. That's the philosophical part of my answer. The more personal, tachlis, pragmatic part of my answer is I'm not doing shit with my art. Like I've no. been complete, and not because I'm jaded, but be before October 7th, I wasn't doing shit with my art. I've been lazy. I mean, I was playing Beethoven. I was practicing my guitar skills. I was keeping my, you know, my workshop, uh, my tools sharp. Since October 7th, I've ha I haven't, I was going to say I haven't had time. I haven't made time. Uh, I, I don't believe in not having time, except in the most dire or specific circumstances. No, I just haven't prioritized it. Uh, mm -hmm. Social media is a lot more immediately gratifying, and I can put create. I can put all of those faculties of mine into it. I can be creative. I can be self-expressive. I can be prismatic or whatever. But it's different than sitting at the piano and being like, "What do I want to say through a song?" Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I'm a songwriter. I'm a musical theater composer and lyricist. I'm ostensibly a professional artist, but I go for long stretches without doing that. And it's, uh, I don't know quite what to make of that. Um, I I did, however, get to co-write a song about a month ago, uh, uh, a parody song, which, you know, didn't I didn't write the music, but I wrote, I co-wrote the lyrics with Katie Halper, the uh, 
the American Jewish mm-hmm. podcaster who works with my brother yeah, okay. Aaron. Yeah, 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 follow so her. So she's yeah. So she's a friend of mine. I I think you guys should interview her for sure. Um, we would love and, her. Yeah, yeah. And you should, and, and I'll t- I'll I'll put a bug in her ear that you guys should be on her show. Um, but we co-wrote a song called "Nothing's Gonna Stop Us Now," the genocide version, based on the nineteen the nineteen eighties song of the same name from uh, from Mannequin, that that movie, you know. And yeah. we 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 wrote a pair. And what's funny is that I used to write parody songs all the time. Where at Zionist summer camp? That's what we would yeah. do. We would write parody songs making fun of each other or bigging yeah. up our own kuta, you know, or or whatever. Like there's just a summer camp thing, and I got really good at it. So in this case, we wrote a BB Biden bromance duet. Oh shit! Uh, <laughs> and it's on it's on YouTube, and it's oh, been we, viewed like we, we got eighty thousand well. times. Yeah, maybe you. I don't know if you guys can can insert a little clip from it into this, but yeah, maybe can go check yeah, yeah. check it out. It's it's on Katie's channel, and I I voiced BB. You and won't Mike you won't Mike. copyright strike the video if we put it. Oh no 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 not at all. Okay, we're already ripping we're already ripping off Starship the original. Oh, okay. Group. <laughs> So I I played the voice of BB and Mike McRae, who is the impersonator from the Jimmy Dore show, who's one of the okay. funniest co- comedians in America, funniest okay. impersonating comedians. He played Biden. And, you know, there's lyrics like, uh, and if the strip runs out of Gazans, we'll go kill their cousins. Nothing's oh. going to stop. And also... Uh, you know, uh, and if our rep gets Am any low, laugh? <laughs> yes, you are. Palestinians have laughed, so you're allowed to laugh. I was worried okay, that okay. they were going to. No, be- they're allowed to laugh. They're allowed to laugh. Am I allowed to laugh? <laughs> but if they laugh, then you're allowed to laugh. Okay, That's okay. the thing, because we did it to be cathartic for people, because it's right there in front of our faces. This is yeah. what they're essentially saying. Other lines I'm very proud of are, um, uh, you know, Bibi says, let them say we're psychos. I don't care about that. History started when Hamas launched their attack. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And then, and if our rep gets any loa, we'll invoke the Shoah. <laughs> and and if South Africa accuses, they just hate the Jews. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, you get the idea. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and some friends of ours we'll made this incredible. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, our friends of mine made, our friends of, some friends of ours made this incredible video to go along with it. So that's propaganda. You know, it's like, yeah. it's, it, it's deliberate. Like we're trying to, but it's more like anti, think, anti-propaganda, I would say. Well, but propaganda is not in itself a negative word. Yeah. Propaganda is the, the, the deliberate uh, propagating of a certain point of view. You're trying to convince people, you're trying to win them over, but yes, it is anti-propaganda in a very big way. It's anti-Hasbara. Yeah. It's and it's trying to give people anti in, intellectual antioxidants. And that's what comedy is supposed to be for, right? George Carlin, Lenny Bruce, Richard Pryor, the great tradition of of of, of stand-up comedy and and you know satirists from from England before that and the whole and and France, you know, taking the piss. Back. Yes. all the way back in and there must have been comedians in in the in the torah too who were making fun of shit i don't know uh, the greeks really pointing out the hypocrisies of power pointing out that the emperor has no clothes yes and giving people an outlet for the tension that they carry because like you said elik there's a there are forces that want you to normalize this and comedy is a great way of saying this is not normal yeah so that was a case where that is a kind of art or craft that I have, you know, satire, lyric writing. Uh, and if I'm not writing musicals right now, at least I can do some of that. So that was a good okay. feeling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, uh, but I would like I, I would like to find that spark in me that wants to just create from that deeper place, not just ha ha ha, look how snarky I am. But yeah. Um, and I trust that it'll come back online when it's time. I, I go through these phases where I'm deeply, deeply artistically engaged and other times when I'm just not. So what what I wanted to say about uh, 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 some of the things that you talked about is that I feel that art always comes from a personal place, but it also always comes from a place that's outside of you because always there is there this interplay between the individual and the society and uh, the world. And I think once you are a person who is aware politically, even if your art comes from a personal place, it will always be also 
political in some sense. There will, there will also be, there will always be like this, uh, this, your politics will in some way be expressed in it. And this, like you, you did this song and, and this song is, is political, like because you are thinking about this a lot, right? Well, the con I mean, the content of the song is political, yeah. you know, then there's, then there's art that yeah. has nothing to do with politics on the surface. But if an artist is, has enough depth, you're going to get something about the world they were living in, in which that art was made. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And, and that itself. So you, if you go to see an art exhibit of an important artist, it's very likely that something in that exhibit is going to contain hints or clues about what was going on in the world and what were the power relations and what were the issues. Maybe there was a war going on at the time that was on everybody's mind, you know? So art is a reflection of the times and it comes through our personal individuality. And then there is some art that is explicitly political, like, you know, Picasso's Guernica or whatever. Um, and, and then there's satire like the thing i did but yeah i mean and so then there's about, there, there's also that, one last thing yeah. one last thing that just it just occurred to me i don't want to lose it yeah, yeah cool. then there's art which is inherently political because of who's making it right so for a palestinian in america to make art right now even if they're not singing about palestine um or really at any time uh members of minority groups making art there's something political about it because their very existence is politicized inside of power structures. It's only white people or people in positions of power who get to make kind of frivolous art that's just yeah. about their feelings and whatever. And even that is political, but they don't realize it because yeah. they're exercising that quote unquote privilege. Privilege, yeah. But you know, I wanted to, I thought I had like with my artistic like uh, process, like I really kind of, individualized myself yes and i thought it also happens because everything is really like collectivized in israel and i started developing this contempt to everything that is like collectivized you know like well that's important yeah but then i thought i kind of withdrew to this isolated uh, spiritual self that just researching his own consciousness and separates from the world and it's also shallow in some way so and now i'm trying to figure it out yeah how to become deep again yeah yeah well there's a word in english an overcorrection you know yeah so that that going within is very important because in order to find your voice that you will then use to 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 be a prism for the times mm -hmm. you have to you have to be able to hear your own thoughts you have to filter out all the bullshit yeah. and especially in any country at all um uh, i mean this is why i love joni mitchell she's someone who goes deep into her own individuality but in so doing she's cleaning out all the shit Mm. So that her voice can then speak to the times more faithfully because she can hear that voice in her that is true. And in a, in a, in a container like Israel, where you guys grew up, of course, you the, the, the authentic part of you rejects the collective because the collective is poisoned by nationalism. Yes. And that's very fake. That, very fake, the collective. Everything absolutely. Is it, it's ersatz. It's, it's is, Israeli pop culture goes from the silly to the sentimental yeah. to the superficial uh a lot of bar this is my own take just based on having grown up around it like yeah. a lot of borrowing from other cultures whether it's american culture like i remember one of the songs we used to sing at, at zionist summer camp was hagal shan mm -hmm. you know that yeah. surfing song you know that yeah. beach boys song Danny you know, Sanderson. And it's just, yeah. what's that danny sanderson Danny Sanderson, right? I think it's a good song. I it's a great song. No, it's great. But it's basically just Beach Boys, you know? Yeah, I know. I know. Or Euro Trash, or very significantly, just totally bastardizing Arab culture. Yeah. And exploiting the, the you know, or there's very good Mizrahi music. Yeah. In Israel, yeah. or there's some, and then there's some decent, you know, folk singer, you know, singer songwriters like David Broza and whoever else. 
Um, and uh, but I, look, what am I talking about? There are some there's some great Israeli songwriters. Nuri Galron had that incredible song in the 80s. You know that song, Acharenu Hamabul? Do you know it? I don't know it. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. It. Maybe if I heard this, it, I knew it, but I don't. Okay, so this song could not exist today. Yeah, this is a bit of a tangent, but this was a genuine pop song in Israel. They taught it. We we learned it. We didn't sing it at summer camp, but we learned about it. The chorus was lo al tesaperli al yada she ibda etena zarakoseli ra, you know. So yes. can we translate it for our, for our? Uh, yeah. Community? No, don't tell me about the. No, don't tell me about the girl, who lost her eye. Yeah. No, no. It just makes me feel bad, and it's about there's the occupied territories, mm -hmm. and there's us here in Tel Aviv living our lives and going to the beach and, you know, strolling down Dizengoff Boulevard, and. Don't bother me with that shit. I don't want to hear about it. You know, and it's excellent, very ironic, but not ha-ha ironic. Mm -hmm. So that's a case of an Israeli songwriter doing her job, which yes. is being a prism for the times. And it's not preachy. She's actually just exposing that aspect of the Israeli cultural collective character. The difference is back then in the 80s or 90s, and this is in the, in the time of the first intifada, there was still that strain in Israeli popular culture of ironic remove and being able to comment on it. These days, you know, the hit song is, what was that terrible song with like the Syrian oh, that, Exactly. You know, oh, or songs let called... Let just explain to the audience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Darbu, I, I've been waiting to talk about this for a little bit, so I, I will explain about this. These, these uh, Israeli song, songwriters... Uh, they do like rap music, like like popular rap music and stuff like that. And the previous song that they did before 7th of October was Tik Katan, small, back, small uh, handbag. Okay? Uh, and it's like a stupid song about club culture. Like, uh, I have a small handbag, I'm, I'm a girl, and, and I have this kind of character. And it's like ironic and like cute, okay? Whatever. Like silly, but cute, okay? And then these guys, after 7th of October... They did Kharbu Darbu. Kharbu Darbu means something like, it's like a pun, it doesn't really mean anything spe specific, but it means destruction and it means, and it means like total annihilation. And the song is like calling the military units and like talking about uh, uh, the Palestinians like rats. And like really horrible, yeah, horrible. We're gonna like go, all the countries army, and we're gonna kick the shit. Yeah, we're gonna annihilate Naz we're Gaza. Gonna exactly. Annihilate Gaza. And this song is like I went on TikTok, and like half of the of the videos that I see is like is like hot girls doing this song. Yeah. Like in all yeah, kinds yeah. of contexts. Yeah, exactly. And and in America, the only an analog to that was after 9-11. You had country singers singing songs like courtesy of the red white and blue you know we're gonna stick a foot up your ass and blah 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 just the right wingers right the reactionary elements reacting to 9 11 that way but this was a number one song in israel and then you've got a song out now i hear calling for the murder of dua lipa and um mia khalifa and other... i think that's just a line from the same song oh it's from the same song okay it's from the same song yeah yeah, yeah but there okay. are like another example another example is uh, let your village burn. This is this is an ah. in Israel. This is from. Putin. Yeah, I've seen people. I've seen people not dance and sing to this. Yeah. No, but it's like they 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 do it on football pitches, like the crowd, uh, especially the racist uh, fans, of course. But now it's also a, they did a techno version of it, like uh, end of October, uh, the, uh, beginning of November. They did a techno version of it, and they produced like. A whole production of it, and now it's an actual song on YouTube. You can find it. Let your video. Yeah. Total insanity, and this is what happens when culture goes fascist. You know, yep. uh, it um, it it becomes sadistic or sentimental. Yeah. Um, Sometimes it, or or both, no, right? In Israel, it's yeah. always you have the suggest you know scale the. Uh, few levels up but it was there all the time right right and it's a and it's a it's a it's a toxic version of one of the things that makes israelis so wonderful is their their depth of emotion and mm -hmm. and and there's a kind of um poetic um sense of of tragedy and togetherness and all that kind of stuff and whatever you want to say about the country's history 
Yeah. You know, because the fact is that it's built on top of a whole lot of delusion and denial. Still, there is something compelling about a small country uh, uh, needing to be proud of itself and stick together yeah, with its people. Defend and, itself from and all defend the itself all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you could at least put a, just like, you know, America is a horrific history of extermination and yet it's made, you know, some, some good music that's come out of it, you know? Well, a uh, lot of, and all, of course. And also Israel, a lot of great music. I, I want to emphasize that uh, both of us really love a lot of Israeli music, yeah. okay? Like yeah. Mati Kaspi, I love him, Kaveret, uh, Danny Sanders. Habiluim, right? Aren't those guys kind of cool? Yeah, they're very, they're very, uh, they have some leftist messages. Yeah. But we were talking about how it's always like I want. Yeah, yeah that's what I wanted to say. Yeah, like I said it, that's, yeah. I don't know. Like I feel that in Israeli pop culture, you have the like the Palestinian story is absent. Yes. The yeah. Occupation is absent, but stuff yeah. like you know gets to the margins, kind of to the. It's there. You hear it in the song, and they don't talk about it explicitly. Only like, directly, it comes only, into yeah, the song. Yeah, like it's a shadow that exists there, and you feel it in many songs, but it, it never, uh, unless it's a very rare case, but yes, yeah. it doesn't go to Even the Biluim, they won't say. No, the, right. Biluim, the Biluim have some, they have a really powerful song about the Nakba, yeah, okay. and yeah. they have. Okay. They have they're they're brave ones i must say but yeah that's well it's a it, it's a self-absorbed culture it's a bunker mentality and mm. i was saying on a a, a live uh, q a that my father and i did that someone asked about how you know the hate in israel and i said yes there is hate but it's based on but what much more widespread and uh and and further entrenched because there's always been hateful elements and now they've taken over. But what's been there for a long time, which allows hate to, is indifference, indifference. and denial. And denial. denial, of and denial which is what exactly that Nurit Galron song was about. Exactly. Just leave me alone about it. I don't want to hear about it. You know? Um, so at its best, art turns the camera around on oneself and on one's own culture. And at its worst, it just becomes a megaphone for the prevailing um, prejudices of of the demographic, and it flatters their self, their, their sense of self. It doesn't challenge them, and it just gives them that dopamine hit of like, yeah, yeah, we're right, and we're on the right side, and everyone's against us, and fuck you, I won't do what you tell me. Uh, that's of course a great song by Rage Against the Machine, but when you turn it around. And say fuck you, I won't be, I won't obey international law like you tell me, or fuck you, I won't stop genociding people like you tell me. Uh, it becomes uh, pretty gross. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and also like things. The more fascism rises, the more severe it becomes. Like I'm thinking about the '90s. Okay, there was a show in Israel in the '90s called Hamishia uh, Kamerit, uh, like the Chamber Quintet, but it's just like five actors. And they did highly political uh, uh, skits, and and um, like some of them were absurd and nonsense, but some of them were highly political. And there was, there was some biting criticism there. Mm -hmm. And I cannot imagine a show like this existing in Israel of twenty twenty four, not even in Israel of two thousand and ten. Mm -hmm. yeah. And no, the second intifada killed that. You know, most of the Israeli yeah. left gave up, which tells you how deep their convictions were to begin with. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, I guess, I guess. Uh, uh, but the point is that now, like the, the, the most popular show, Eretz Nederet, it's also like a skit show. But the Ugh. skits, yeah, exactly, exactly. They're, they're like mainstream liberals talking within like the very narrow confines of mainstream liberal uh, discussion. And that's all they can do. And they call them leftists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But liberals who seem to love taking pot shots at like, blue-haired american college students like they love yes exactly basically making you know transphobic and uh yeah. and just just punching down you know just like just anyone who who expresses solidarity with palestinians or who is vulnerable in a way is ridiculous to them and it's 
and it's just so uncreative. Like in a, in addition to being um, offensive, yeah. uh, it's just not good comedy. I don't care no, about offensiveness, no actually. I don't. If you put in the craft to make something good, there's always going to be a grain of truth. But these are just lies. These are just, it's just lazy, lazy humor, you know, to, you know, to just delivered to an audience full of clapping seals who are just like, ooh, 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 like you're just pushing their buttons and, and giving, again, flattering their own prejudices rather than challenging anybody. To be honest, Saturday Night Live has become that. It used to have some bite to it, but it at a certain point became just a place for liberals to jerk themselves off and feel good about themselves. Yeah. Uh, um, and the, the the goal of this, the goal of Eretz Nederet, I think, or, or these specific skits that talk about the left, the crazy left with the purple hair, like you said, uh, uh, is, is distraction, basically. Yeah. Because when people in Israel speak about those leftists who have gone insane because uh, they are anti-Semites or they are being fooled by anti-Semites, uh, they do not have to look at themselves and they do not have to, to see what they are doing. So this is, uh, uh, I think the main goal of this is distraction. Yeah. It's true, which is why Zionism is, it, it, it's just anti-comedy. You can't believe in that ideology and still be funny because you're fundamentally missing the point you don't have access to the perception of ridiculousness because you're the ridiculous one you know yeah but the irony is all the joke is on you by always. definition always yeah. but you can't admit that so you have to project that outward onto everybody else and you just end up coping and sounding yeah. ridiculous yeah, and the arrogance that they talk about, you know, all oh, these student colleges, this walk, woke, uh, you know, and like since I start talking about, you know, about this publicly, I talk to so many people around the world and I like, they know so much more than so many Israelis who makes like fun of them, you know, yeah, like yeah. They know more about, yeah, and I think like you're looking down at them and yeah, I, of of course, then when you know there's, I guess there's also stupid people who just join camp because they want to join a camp because it's know, popular now. Because it's certain. popular, sure. Of course, like it exists. I don't deny. Yeah, well, I don't know. I I wouldn't even say that. I mean, there have been people who got on the Palestine bandwagon in the past who weren't really mm -hmm. committed to anything or whatever. Or maybe there are some anti semites who join up. I mean, who there is that it exists. But in a moment where there's a genocide going on, where yeah. anyone with a, with any moral <clears throat> aliveness in them looks yeah. at these images, I don't I, I, I don't see any bandwagon jumping. I, and in fact, the ridiculous thing is when you see these propagandists being like like Tiffany Haddish, this African American um, comedian who used to be very funny, okay, uh, just took a flight to Israel. She's also Jewish. Uh, <clears throat> took a flight okay. to Israel to come see for herself, you know, and I'm convinced all these, these D list celebrities, or maybe she's C list um, or B list uh, are being paid. I, I, or... Yeah. 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 Michael Rappaport and Deborah Messing. And these just oh, awful... Michael Rappaport. Oh, I saw him. He is annoying. Yeah. I, I can't, I can't. I mean, Israel, that. Israel <laughs> should pay him to stay away. He's just, <laughs> he's such a liability, yeah. but someone posted, who was it? Was it Hen Mazig or Ilon Levy or Shai Davidai or one of these fuckers? One of these guys who are indistinguishable from each other. Absolutely indistinct. Well, they, they each have their own flavor of yeah. shit, uh, in different tasting notes, but it's yeah. the same basic flavor. Yeah. Um, said, it's impossible to overstate the courage it takes for Tiffany Haddish to come and face the hate and the anti-Semitism. And I'm thinking like, it takes no courage whatsoever. <laughs> You know, it's the easiest, laziest position. Yeah. If you want to really risk your career, speak up for Palestine. Yeah, speak up for people have been fired all over the place, not just in Israel, but like in, in Germany, in the US, have been fired all over for speaking up for Palestine. This is the real Os risky position. Oscar winner Susan Sarandon. I spent a few hours with her a couple of months ago, helping her try to craft a, a response went after her her talent agency fired her for speaking at a Palestine rally. This is a woman with an Academy Award. I held her Academy Award. I was at her place. This yeah. is a woman who's won the highest honor in Hollywood, Best yeah. Actress. 
and she appears at a rally and speaks for two minutes and says one sentence that's maybe ill-chosen words, but it didn't matter. That was just a pretext. Is yeah. the fact was she she was there and she spoke up, and uh, they want to that's, silence people. That's, want that's to the silence. real cancel culture. Zionism yeah. is the original cancel culture. Yeah, so so that also uh, refutes the claim that that uh, people are bandwagoning because why would you ban bandwagon on a position that puts you in danger? Like it, it's a bandwagon to bankruptcy. Yeah, 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 exactly. So so people who are in this uh, 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 fight, they really believe in it. They're not just bandwagoning because there is no real reason to do it. It takes courage. Yes, and it takes courage for anybody, and it especially takes courage for. For people of color, for for Arab Americans, who are already facing, uh, you know, systemic obstacles, people have complimented me for my courage, and that's the one thing I won't allow because it just takes no courage whatsoever for me to do this. I have nothing to lose. I'm completely uncancelable. I don't have a boss. I don't work for any company. Yeah, my that's the good. book I wrote is already out there. I'm getting passive income from this best selling book. I'm living awesome. here in Brooklyn. I am privileged the way the Zionists tell me I am. And I'm going to fucking use my privilege for the best possible purpose I can. Um, so it 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 takes a certain fortitude, I guess, to keep doing it. But it's not brave or courageous. The people who are courageous are the ones who have something to lose, which is a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I still don't know what do I have to lose yet. Actually, <laughs> I, I think I, I think people who live in Israel have some have something to lose. This is this is a part that needs to be discussed more. I think that when when uh, 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 people in Israel are Zionists, many of them I don't know to what degree, and I don't know how many of them, but many of them to some degree, it's because they have something to lose, something material yes. to lose, and. We need to understand that this is the situation when we want to approach this, because that's right. when people have something material to lose, they will behave differently from people who don't have something material to lose. And the way that we handle the situation must be different. And this leads me to the next question. So I, I did a segue. <laughs> uh, and the next question is, we really, I, I, I will talk about myself, maybe Alec will agree with me. I really appreciate the way that you talk to and about Zionists, okay? Because we both know how difficult it is. Okay, and we wanted to ask you like about talking to Zionists because we must at some point uh, uh, have some sort of discussion with Zionists in order to solve what uh, uh, the situation here. It is obvious that they need to be part of the discussion, but at this point, I don't know if they can be a part of any actual discussion. So. We wanted to ask you, how do you talk to Zionists? How do you think one should talk to Zionists? Uh, um, do we even need to talk to Zionists right now or in the future? And uh, do we need to just make fun of them? What do you think? Yes, no, all of the above. It depends on the okay. context. Everything is context. Mm -hmm. You know, if I have a strength in my advocacy, you could call it activism, it seems more like advocacy to me. Mm -hmm. um, it's that I'm able to phase shift, you know, like a sort of science fiction alien who you can't shoot because they're constantly going through between different dimensions, you know? So mm -hmm. one, one minute I'm being very sincere and, and gentle and making a heartfelt appeal. The next minute I'm calling someone a piece of shit on Twitter. Mm -hmm. The next minute I'm just being kind of flat. It depends on who I'm talking to. So there's professional paid Zionists who are doing outright damage and who are knowingly, knowingly lying mm. like Elon Levy. Yes. This fucking Oxford educated scumbag. Yes. Yeah. Who, you know, um, or, or so many of these people, anyone with a blue check on Twitter who's doing it, I'm going to show them the most absolutely withering contempt not because I'm going to convince them. I'm not going to convince them. They they are robots at this point. What yeah. I'm going to do is show people that you don't have to be intimidated by these people. I'm going to expose their lies and I'm going to make them look ridiculous. That's an appropriate tactical choice for them. Now, if they were here in front of me, I probably wouldn't do that. I'd say, look, 
you have your job to do. I have my job to do in the public eye. My job is to insult you and make you look ridiculous. But if you want to have a conversation, let's have a conversation mm -hmm. because it's my persona attacking their persona. It's all in the game, you know? I see. It's a good... It's a then good. there's the Zionists in my DMs. Yeah, okay. The comments. Now we can split them into several camps. Some of them just want to come in and be antagonistic and mm -hmm. abuse. Call me a capo. Call me a self-hating Jew. Just the most lazy, uh, desperate whatevers. Them I ignore or I just, or I block, Yeah, you know, because I don't have time for that. But then there's people who are really genuinely aggrieved and upset mm. by what I'm saying. And they're bewildered by how can a Jew say this? And I can sense that sometimes underneath the hostility. Now, if I sense that, that's an opportunity. Now, of course, it is a question for me of how much time do I want to spend DMing with people. Sometimes what, I just before leave. that even before that even how do you distinguish between the two the two kinds of people? I don't know. I just have to feel it out. Okay. Usually the... I find it very. I, I know from my experience talking to Zionists that one of the things that frustrated me the most was trying to distinguish between people who are trying to actually have a discussion with me and people who who just want to insult and and yell. I have come to the conclusion that it's almost always the second one, but only... Yeah, but, but that's not the question. Are they trying to have a discussion with me? Okay. The question is, is there a crack in their worldview? Are they coming from a place of turmoil that they would be able to recognize if I pointed it out? Is there, a, is there an anguish there? So it's an emotional thing, actually, because all of this is coming from emotion. Now, someone who's just coming from an, you know, and is not leaving any room, just just usually one line insults or whatever, whatever. But someone who writes longer than a paragraph, you're going to actually, you know, I'm a mental chiropractor. That's this modality that I invented where I take walks with people and I help get them unstuck. If I can hear that someone is actually stuck, there's a hidden intention in there. They're not aware of it. Mm -hmm. But if I could somehow bring something to rest for them, that was a better alternative than what they're stuck with, they might be open to it. As Leonard Cohen said, there's a crack in everything. It's how the light gets in. Exactly. Now, again, it is an open question for me that I have to be mindful of and discerning how much time do I want to spend convincing people or arguing with people. But if someone comes to me with like genuinely bewildered by what I'm saying and saying, but, but, but Hamas this or Oslo that mm -hmm. or blah, 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 blah. Then I can calmly say, okay, I hear you. And if you're open to another perspective, here it is. And then I just calmly say, I think you have the facts wrong. Mm -hmm. You've been told this. Uh, in fact, if you want to find out the real truth, here are some Israeli Jewish sources you can look at because I don't imagine you're open to any others. So I'll make this easy as possible for you. Yes. If you're not open to it, you might not want to ask, you might want to ask yourself, why aren't I open to it? What are you afraid would happen if you exposed yourself to a different point of view? And just, just put the mirror up and be like, here's what I'm seeing in your question. And just don't take the bait. Don't get dragged into their angst. So that's a time when it naturally, like naturally my what way is the of... Bait? What is the bait, please? What, what, what is the bait and what are they, they trying to achieve? Again, they are being driven by forces they are not aware of. Unless it's a propagandist who's paid, who has a playbook, these are ordinary people who are trying to hold on to something. Now, you said something interesting. Zionists in Israel have something to lose materially. That is true. They could lose relationships. They could lose jobs. They could go to jail, all that. But they also have things to lose immaterially. What do I mean by that? emotionally they have something to lose like they're they have an, they have an identity to lose and yeah. human beings will kill rather than give up their identity as axel rose said in the guns and roses song locomotive i've worked too hard for my illusions just to throw them all away and that is real talk and human beings will do anything to hold on to their identity because without it they don't know who they'd be and Israelis have been sold a bill of goods that says without this Zionist identity, the world will destroy you. Mm -hmm. Now that is deep and that is visceral and that is down to the toddler level. Like it's 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 lizard brain stuff, right? So if I how understand that, how, how, how do, do you, you deal with that? Such a thing. 
Well, first of all, you don't have to deal with it. I choose to deal with it because I have a certain skill set that I've developed and I'm able to do it in a way that is calm and sometimes effective, obviously not always, and maybe not even often. For many people, it would just be a waste of time. So I'm not saying you have to, but if you choose to it, if you choose to, how you deal with it is, <clears throat> first of all, you have some compassion for them, which doesn't mean sympathy, which doesn't yeah. mean like, wow, I really hear you. None of that stuff. I've seen people try to do that and you end up just kind of suppressing your own anger and then you explode. Like I've seen my dad do that actually. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I don't think it's effective. No, you can, you can be disgusted by them. But at the same time, I recognize, oh yeah, there's a human being who's just caught in, they're trapped in a cult. Why don't you just say to yourself, they're in a cult? How would you speak to a, a member who's in a cult? That's something I've been thinking very often recently. Like yeah. how, how yeah. to speak to people who are in cults. Cult members, ultimately the cult will fall apart. Either it'll fall apart in a giant suicide uh, mass, you know, like Waco or, no, Waco, that wasn't a suicide. Uh, that was a CIA or FBI raid. But other other you know suicide cults, okay. um, or it'll it'll implode or it'll fall apart and then people will be disillusioned and lost, or people will come out of it on their own. But they're going to come out of it on their own on their own time. You can't force it, but you can plant the seeds, because all it takes to plant the seeds of disillusionment is to create a glitch in their matrix. Something doesn't compute, huh? This explanation, this airtight explanation I've been given for why the world is the way it is and who I need to belong to and what I need to push aside and suppress or forget about in order to stay safe, it's like everyone is Neo and the matrix will reveal itself to be a matrix at a different point. Now, not everyone's going to wake up out of the pod and not everyone's going to take the red pill, but you can offer it. Yes. But you notice that Morpheus was not particularly attached to whether Neo took it in that moment. Mm. Even though Neo was the one, Morpheus was like, choose. He really let him choose. And because that's him. He, he has to choose. Yeah. Because you if can't he, understand so, anything that you haven't chosen to, to understand or, or to try. That is exactly right. Now, if I'm attached to changing their mind, now I'm taking the bait because I'm getting sucked into their trauma vortex. I am increasing the energetic. If you think about it in terms of energy, you know, I'm increasing the centrifuge of their angst and I'm resisting them. And if I resist them, they're going to resist me. You know, you could do an exercise where, um, hey, do, do an exercise for me, okay? Turn to each other. Okay. Yeah, okay. No, no, just one hand. Uh, so yeah, Alec, put up your right and and I got, now, <clears throat> Elik, push. What does Alone automatically do? Pushing back. Yeah, I need to push okay, back. Okay, right. And you guys could stay like this for an hour or 80 years, as the case may be, mm. right? I would prefer uh, less than 80 years. Right. Okay, so Elik, so this, now, now release the pressure. Mm. And this time, Elik, push, and Alone just don't resist at all. Okay. Yeah. No, no, now you're resisting. Oh, right. At the very don't end there. Yeah, don't all. resist. I can't do it. Don't. Well, yes, you can. Okay, Just let okay. it happen. Yeah. Just no. take care. Take your hand away. That's how not to resist. See, this is what I call judo, J E W D O. Oh. Or jujitsu. <laughs> jujitsu, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is working with their energy and just letting it, you know, I'm not going to resist them. Yeah, I'm like, okay, you know, I got it. You, maybe you can give me some advice in this subject, okay? Because is this making any sense, first of all? Like, does, yes, it, it does. resonate as possibly useful? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. And there's, I had many thoughts while you we were talking, because I, I want to tell you about something. I, I scheduled a, some, some conversation in my Facebook page, which usually I communicate in Hebrew, like the... And I've been started to write, I, I wrote a post like in Hebrew for my Hebrew friends that uh, I feel that I need to get out of the anti-Zionist closet and I need to speak to them in Hebrew because I feel I've been doing it in English for a while. And I know, and I have this also traitor voice in my mind, you know, that I just speaking to the world and not, and I, and I felt like in order to feel like whole and complete, I need to say, I, I say to you, to your face, the way it is. 
but you needed to practice on the world before you could take it back to them because that's yeah, the language that you see that la I'll, I'll let you finish but it just mm -hmm. occurs to me that of course you didn't know how to use hebrew to speak about this because he modern hebrew is a tool of zionism yes. like the language it's built into the language its assumptions its idioms its phrases its attitudes now you can be an ant, but, but you have to repurpose the language yeah and I'm just say I read him a song I wrote about it. How yeah. I'm gonna save the Hebrew from the Zionist machine and stuff, you know, like that. Hey, something <laughs> yeah. I'm working on. Cause you know I can be creative in like I feel that when I write in Hebrew, it's much deeper and much more, you know. There's multi layers in English. It's just like you know, bland. It's like what it is. That's how I write. Huh. Huh. <laughs> yeah. But there was, I was writing like on the Facebook, my post, and there's a guy that I know that he lives in some settlement in the West Bank. He's a street artist. He organized a gig for me once. And he always responds, and he always responds. Um, he writes, there is content to his arguments, but he also writes like nasty language, like you're stupid, you're dumb. I was also in one of these discussions. Yeah, uh, I, uh, bless you. I can attest that that this guy is uh, very uh, is is very hurtful. Like he says hurtful things. Yeah. Stupid is tipesh, right? Yeah, and tipesh, and he says you have a, what he keeps writing that I am mo motivated by shallow humanism. That's what he writes. Uh huh. Yeah, and as opposed to what? That's it, and. As, so opposed to, as, as opposed to deep nationalism? Fuck <laughs> off. <laughs> profound, profound chauvinism. Like, <laughs> that. This, this disdain, this disdain for anything universalist yeah. is very and, interesting. And he keeps writing, and I never answered him. Like, my policy is I don't erase comments, but I don't feel I have to engage with people who write, like... That's fine. Yeah, but then I, he wrote in comment, I... Eli can keep trying to talk to you and you just ignore me. He wrote something like this. So I saw, okay, uh -huh. really, so I wrote him personal message because I know I'm like, listen, man, I would like to engage in a conversation with you, but the way you speak is like threatening me and I don't feel... And then he apologized of how he speaks. Which is very surprising. I he think. apologized immediately. I was surprised. I yeah. was surprised to hear I've had that happen too. I don't accuse people of threatening me. I accuse people of insulting me. Yeah. Someone came at me. You know, there's, <laughs> there's a, a Jay Z lyric: "Sensitive thugs, y'all need hugs." You know, Aww. these people come at me, and 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 you know, like they call. You know, someone. I posted that video that my brother and my dad did on YouTube. You know, and someone writes, "Bullshit! These are self-hating Jews." And then I was like, okay, I guess you don't want to have a conversation then. And she's like, don't get me wrong. I love your father. He yeah. saved my life. He's uh, wonderful. And I think you guys are great. Blah, 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 blah. And blah, blah, blah. And I would love to talk to you about it. I was like, okay, apologize first. Mm -hmm. Like you didn't come to me with respect. Yes. yes. So yeah. what I, another thing I do is I set the terms of the discussion. Mm -hmm. You don't to set the terms of discussion you don't get to take out your shit on me and then change gears and be all nice that's what narcissistic abusers do you know shlomi don't play that i'm like you know we're gonna talk and if we're gonna talk you got to clean up how you started this thing yeah and the point is that we schedule the ske a facebook live that we talk you know and i'm already as an anti-Zionist Israeli that think like I'm going to do it in Hebrew with him. It's not going to be like it with, with all the supportive od audience that I'm going no. to. And I'm going to talk to him and I'm super stressed. And, <laughs> and I thought maybe it was a mistake. Mm. But, uh, and, and he said, you will set the terms of the discussion. I promise to talk in a respectful manner. That's and, enough. and he said, that, and let's not make it a debate about facts, but just talking honestly about important issues. So I, so yeah, okay. So you want some coaching, some free coaching? Because I I saw you doing it, and I like the way you, I saw a, a kind of you had a conversation with a Zionist, and I felt you did. Which one? The one the one with Rudy Rockman or the one with the Dandelion King? 
I think the Dandelion King. I was... Yeah. You know, I debated an active duty IDF soldier. Really? Yeah. This slick propagandist named uh, Rudy. I, who, I saw uh, a bit his stuff. Yeah. He's very, uh, very slick. Oof. <laughs> oof. He wow. is. I mean, I got to give him credit. He's good at what he does. Yeah. But he's a, but he's a, he's a fox, you know, mm. uh, in terms of he's a, he, he's, he's very deceptive, I think. Um, I wanted to like him because he's very charming. He mm. called me his brother and all this shit. Yeah. But um, no. So do you want some free coaching for that set? When when are you doing it? I need to schedule, but it's going to be next week around Monday, I think. I would love to watch it, even though I won't understand every word. I won't understand most of it. But um, So our audience will, will uh, uh, gain from this uh, free coaching that... And it can get it. Yeah. Also, our audience is getting pre coach, uh, pre coaching. Yeah. Yeah. You should call this episode. Watching the Allah, okay. So please. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Watching. And I hope you'll name this episode Jiu Jitsu. <laughs> Jiu Jitsu. Okay. Oh, yes. Oh, nice. Yes. <laughs> Jiu Jitsu instruction with Daniel Mate. Yes. Um, I'm your sensei. Uh, Great. <laughs> yeah. So, in a situation like this where you've already success and kudos for already setting the terms of the debate, mm -hmm. just by being honest like i don't like being spoken to that way mm -hmm. and then that because you know what there's a part of him that doesn't like speaking to you that way yeah he's not doing it it's doing him mm -hmm. he's infected with a mind virus and it takes him over and he turns into a werewolf and then he comes back to his human self he's like oh that's my friend elik <laughs> yeah you know and maybe part of him when how immediately <laughs> apologized because yeah and it was really right sad. no i've had people i've had people do this too right and then and then you say okay that's not acceptable then you've got to really stick to it during the thing so if he crosses that line you say hey we had an agreement mm -hmm. don't take the bait step out of the game you know if you don't have a referee there you say i'm not playing on those terms right. and then for the thing itself you know look you are playing an away game here you are speaking to a hostile crowd yeah. But if they're tuning in, they want to know what you're going to say. And I think there's probably a lot of Israelis who are like, these Jews who are losing their religion, <laughs> to quote R.E.M., you know, mm -hmm. what's up with them? How can they speak this way when, when, when Hamas did what they did on October 7th? Mm -hmm. How can they say this when our brave boys and girls and yeah. inside are going and defending us, right? And there's a part of them that wants to know, because there's a part of them that also wants to know what is it like to step outside of the norm? And what is it like to, to be brave like you, right? Now, until they hear something in what you say that clicks for them, they're just, their automatic re reflex is going to be to dismiss it because they're threatened by the notion of themselves ever doing that because they know they would have something to lose. Yeah. So you become a punching bag and they project all of their fear and shame onto you. Just like Zionists who call me self-hating are the ones who are deeply rejecting the vulnerable parts of their Judaism because they're attached to a Zionism that is trying to solve it. Yes. So just know that that's happening in the background and they're not going to say that because they they are they can't. Mm -hmm. they, they don't even know it. They don't even know know it but there's a curiosity in there somewhere if they're tuning in and from there i would say your 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 political arguments are going to do less they're important uh but they need to be held in a container of you just sharing why you how you came to this mm -hmm. just your experience yeah you know like growing up i always knew there was something mm -hmm. off I'm just going to put words in your mouth here. You what you replace it with whatever. It's this is what I would say if, the if first I was an anti. I did was exactly those words you said. Okay. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. So I always knew there was something off, but there was so much upside to not questioning that, and so much downside to questioning it that I never did. And I figured I could just get along, and it's okay. And maybe I'm just on the left of the zionist spectrum and i don't have to like it but so on and so forth mm. but at a certain point something cracked and you could tell stories of here i was and this teacher said this or i was talking to this soul and something in me noticed this isn't normal mm. and 
Then I studied history and I've learned that in any time where a country went insane and did horrible things that it later regretted, people had to wake up out of a false dream of normalcy. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, oh, shit, I'm living in one of those times. And for whatever reason, I'm one of the people to wake up first. And that's a very uncomfortable thing. It's a very lonely thing. But it's also, I can't, once I see it, I can't unsee it. And I understand why people don't want to see it. I was talking to Alon Lee Green of Breaking the Silence. Uh, sorry, not Breaking yeah. the Silence. Uh, Omdi Biacha the other day. Omdi Biacha, yeah, standing together. And yeah, and these guys get a lot of shit from people for not being radical enough or whatever, especially spectators who aren't in Israel or Palestine. Yeah. You know, people who want a radical, rah, rah, anti-Zionist Israeli left who's going to burn their passports and not use the word Israel and all that. I, I, I don't want to say the, the BDS, the BDS did, uh, I, I read something that criticizes uh, standing together by the BDS. I think they made some good points, okay? It's not just... They might make, I, I'm not, I'm not saying they're wrong entirely. It's but a I, and It's a discussion, and I actually asked Alone about it. I interviewed him for... Yeah, okay, um, okay. For, well, for a podcast curious, yeah yeah it, it'll it's on it, i was a guest host on this a guest interviewer on this podcast it'll okay, come out okay. soon <clears throat> and i put it to him you know i was like what about people who say you're you're you know you need to be calling for one state you need to be anti-zionist openly and he said look thank you for your input spectators from the outside who who are essentially wanting to see a certain kind of theater and you don't like the theater that you're seeing we are here on the ground mm -hmm. and even and if you talk to palestinians here in israel about anti-zionism they'll say what are you talking about like of course i'm not a zionist but like i can't afford to be talking that way and similarly jewish israeli activists who are trying to get through to people which is exactly what you guys are talking to me about they could say that stuff, but you might as well be speaking Lithuanian, you know, to Here people. We you... saying this stuff. Right? Yeah, yeah. That's well, but, a bit, I don't know what. To but say but it but that's that but that's fine. It's actually fine. You guys are also doing an important service. I'm not saying you shouldn't do it, but them as a group of Israelis and Palestinians, literally standing together, that's their thing. Yeah. They're trying to have mainstream appeal. You guys are like the catcher's mitt or the net that's trying to catch people who have already fallen off the tightrope. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. And if you if you catch them, you can say, okay, I got you. This is going to be scary, but I'm going to give you the Narcan. I'm going to, I'm going to give you the method. <laughs> you know, you're, you're going to be fine. You're going to go through withdrawal, but we got you. We're basically and nurses. That's what you're, you're saying. You are. You're field nurses, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's really valuable. So what I'm saying is it's no, neither side is right or wrong. You're fulfilling different functions. You have to understand what your function is. Yeah. You're making it fun and cool and appealing and your aliveness and your uncompromising language, but also the fact that you are now, and as you come back to speaking more Hebrew and finding the language, then you'll be interfacing. And it's not about being as radical as you can. Mm. And if using the word anti-Zionist with those people isn't effective, don't use it. Just say our country's gone insane and I don't like our future. I, I have some thoughts about that. I think we should have uh, Alon Le Green over for a conversation. Mm. And yeah. I, think, I think the subject of this conversation should be how to convey a radical message in a fascist society mm -hmm. and different approaches to this and the approach of standing together is very different from our approach and I have some personal criticism on on their approach and I don't know if it's even my place but so they so we told you you're you, uh, you're not on the ground okay and you don't know and you're not from Israel but we are from Israel okay yeah and and so we have a different perspective on this. And I, I am also a radical. I, I am an Israeli. I am, I'm a Hebrew uh, a Canaanite, okay? But I am also a radical. And Are you recording I, again, by the way? Excuse me? Are you recording again? Yes. Yes, yes. Okay. We are recording. Uh, but I am also a radical. And uh, I, as a radical, I have some opinions about 
things that appear to be radical, but in reality are a little bit, um, let's say, reserved. Sure. And, and I think that doing this can also damage uh, uh, what we are doing. Like, like, it also silences. Okay, so for example, when I say something ultra radical, I open the gate for other people for other people to say something that is maybe just as radical or even less radical, and they will not be considered as insane because I said it. Yes. And when they say things that are not radical, it does the reverse. Mm. Because now I don't have as much legitimacy to, see, to be radical because people say, look at standing together. They are uh, bringing uh, a, a future of cooperation. And they are not; they are much nicer than you. Mm -hmm. So maybe you should learn from them. But I don't know if I want to learn from them. <laughs> I think I also have my 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 uh, role in this. So I think yep. this is a very interesting discussion. That, that is a very interesting discussion. I I have a sense of what he would say to you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just I was impressed with the guy. You know, yeah, whatever yeah. you think of I'm him, I'm impressed with him as well. Uh, I was I was impressed with uh, the thoughtfulness and the the the, the conviction. And the the political um, reasoning, yes. you know Norman Norman Finkelstein, who you would think of as a radical, right? He got canceled by the BDS left in the two thousands because yeah. he called it a cult, not small b, small d, small s, as in boycotting, divesting, divesting, and sanctioning, all of which are legitimate tactics, but the capital B, capital D, capital S um, the movement organization. The specific organization that sort of rose up and declared itself Palestinian civil society, uh, and that um, in his criticism was that it's a kind of posturing of radicalism without uh, thinking clearly about political objectives, because BDS, capital B, capital D, capital S, didn't take a position on Israel's existence. In other words, they said, we're agnostic. Maybe we should, you know, maybe Israel should be dismantled. Maybe there should be a two-state solution. Uh, we're not going to say because we have different people within. And he said, look, you're appealing to international law here. If you want to appeal to international law and reach a broad public, if you want to be able to go at the green, you have to stop at the red. It doesn't matter what the moral position is, but for a broad-based political movement, you have to have achievable goals which is to reach a broad public. And he would quote Gandhi on this. He went back and read a lot of Gandhi and wrote a, wrote a book called What Gandhi Says. It was more of a pamphlet and applied it to the BDS case and was basically saying, in his opinion, a broad public can be taken to the very edges of implementing 242, dismantling the wall, dismantling, you know, removing the settlements, basically the 1967 legalities of the occupation. Is that right? No. Do the Palestinians have a legal right uh, or a moral right to return entirely, and which would essentially end the Jewish state? Absolutely they do. But it's one thing to have a right. It's another thing to exercise it. And that's a political question. Now, you can agree with him. You, cannot, you can disagree with him. But he was such a heretic for saying it that all of a sudden he stopped being invited onto university campuses. So he had already been canceled by the Zionists, thanks to Dershowitz. And now he's canceled by the anti-Zionists. So all of that to say, I think what Alone would say to you is the other Alone. Uh, there are two the Alone. Other, uh, alo the other Alone. Yeah, you're Alone and he's Alone Lee. Yeah. I think what Alone Lee would say is, I'm not trying to be radical. I'm trying to be effective. Mm -hmm. We have different aims. Yeah. And as long as I don't betray you, as long as I don't badmouth you and say, look, these guys are, you know, as long as I don't get in your way don't get in ours and if he was if it was just a group of jewish israelis doing this i yes, think your your I, I think your reservation would have a bit more teeth to it yes yes you, your your distrust would be better placed given that he's working with sally and all these other palestinian israelis who have their own considerations that they're coming from and have tactically decided that if we're going to reach an israeli public we're going to have to convince them in the name of their own self-interest. So then there's going to be some who can be reached with a radical message like you guys, but probably way more of them are going to be reached with a kind of more Shalom Achshav style 
uh, appeal. And now just that to I, say, just to say that yeah. for most of the Israeli public, a lonely green is like super radical. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> I understand. I understand. But, so no, but oh, hold on, hold on. Shalom, Achshav. I will not accept that because Shalom, Achshav have become. Uh, uh, shalom Achshav means peace now in Hebrew. I'm talking about. I'm talking about the traditional Shalom. Oh, the okay, just so just so people know, because yeah. this is crazy in my mind. Shalom Achshav means peace now. This is a movement that was about peace in the 90s. They were like the leaders of the 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 the, the 80s too. They started with the the Lebanon War, I think. And now they are supporting what is going on in Gaza. Just so you understand. Yeah. yeah. They, they are not change their name. silent about it. They are mildly supporting it. Wow. Yeah, they should still. they should change their name to you know uh or Shalom now, Machar. Like, you know, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Shalom Machar. Shalom Machar, yeah. Shalom yeah, yeah. peace tomorrow, but not now. Peace tomorrow. Now, now yeah. it's war. Yeah. I'm talking about the tradition of the Meretz party, yeah. the tradition of the, you know, and that's what they've inherited and they're trying to keep that alive. And I think there's a nobility to that and it doesn't have to be your gym, but that's kind of a, an aesthetic. Like, it's just not, like, you don't vibe with that. You guys are creating your own vibe, which is great. And so I was compelled by his, his um, non-defensive defense. He's like, you guys can have your opinions, but we've made a tactical, uh, you know, and and the fact that they can coalesce people like Maozi Non and and uh, uh, I believe he's he's done events with them. You know, like the the families of survivors have a lot of leverage here. Those are the families of victims of October seventh. It's about where what are the leverage points? What are the pressure points? What will Israelis listen to? And the fact is, it sucks and it's morally disgusting and depressing. But talking about human rights does not land. For most people, talking about the suffering on the other side of that border that we have no idea about does not land. Talking about we're losing our humanity might start to land, but you have to show them in their world what the impact is. And from there, once they, you know, another very interesting thing about the conversation with Alon, what I didn't realize <clears throat> is that Omdim Biachad sprang from a class based struggle. Yes. He was a union leader. Yeah. He unionized the first coffee shop union or something and was, you know, and went to court to assert his right to do so and he won. And then within the union movement there was a there was a Palestinian Israeli leader that a lot of workers coalesced around. Now they might not have agreed with his politics, but he was such a strong advocate for class solidarity and so, I forget so his name. His name? Maybe we should have him over as well. I forget. I okay, no. I'd have would... to ask. I'd have to ask Alon Lee. But would... but from there, that was a gateway to people asking. Okay, well, what when you start to? This is the great thing about class based organizing because you get your own material interests and you say, oh, wait a minute, these other people have more in common with me than I have in common side. with the with the power structure that's telling me those are my enemy. Bob Dylan had a great song in 1964 called "Only a Pawn in Their Game." Mm -hmm. The white politician preaches to the poor white white man, you've got more than the blacks don't complain. And it's all about how the poor southern hick hillbilly white man is just a pawn in the game used about against so you have to killed, right an activist that's something. who killed Medgar Evers. Yeah. yeah. The young black man, you know. So that's going against the prevailing rat, you know, radical or would be radical approach in the 2010s which is to call out white people and to you know call out privilege and all that nothing wrong with alerting people to their blind spots but if you really want to galvanize people i think there's something to be said for meeting them where they're at but saying hey even on the even on the narrow premise that you're coming from which is we, we need to ensure our bitachon our security this occupation is a disaster. This genocide is a disaster. How is that going for us? And I say this to people all the time. Hamas has said, we're going to do more and more October 7th. I said, well, why do you think October 7th happened? What do you think is going to happen to those kids who, who by some miracle survive this? Who are they going to become? What are they dreaming about right now in terms of revenge? Who are the Jews to them right now? What this is this doing for anti-Semitism in the world? This is the most scary thing in my mind. We are creating so many traumatized people, so many traumatized people. And what do traumatized people do? 
I don't know, but many of them take up arms. I don't know. Those who don't, I'm those who don't self-destruct, self-destruct or find a healing path again, you know, inshallah, uh, no. they, they, of course they take up arms and they, they would be, I would have every sympathy for the impulse to take revenge for these horrors. I'm not saying I would advocate it, but if we saw a movie, there's a million Hollywood movies where Denzel Washington or Liam Neeson or someone just goes crazy because of what was done to their family and they, or Keanu Reeves, you know, uh, and we identify with that. It's a human thing. Mm -hmm. And it's, so it's just unintelligent. And if you meet people on the ground of what you say you're committed to, mm -hmm. if that's your intention, then you've got it completely dafuk. You got it completely backwards and upside down. You're not going to get what you say you want. So either you admit that's not what you want, either you admit that actually what you want is more violence and more victimization and you want to be, you want to have everyone against us and all that because you get off on that, in which case, fine, that's your choice. Or wake up to the fact that your illusions are the things that are making us unsafe. And I think that's what Alone Lee and his group are doing. So yeah. I think they have a role to play. I think you guys have a role to play. And ideally, <clears throat> there would be com tactical conversations between radicals like you and um, what can I, I think say? They're also radical in their own way. I, I, I they just, are. I just don't think they're radical enough. That that is Fine. my criticism. Let, let me so just say it very very clearly. I'm not. I I respect this group very much. I, I I stood together with them. I went to some of their protests. My criticism is only you are not doing it uh, radical enough. And I think this is a tactical error or a strategic error. Well, that's mean. a conversation. You know, reasonable people can, dis can exactly. differ on strategy. Exactly. You know, but I will say this: if they weren't doing something radical, there would be no consequences to them for doing what they're doing. But there are. Yes. Yes. That's mm -hmm. So I don't think you can. I don't think you can dismiss anybody who is paying a cost for their politics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also I think like if you truly want to stop this, you know, like. I, like I'm here supportive of the struggle of the family hostages, you know, that they don't talk about the Palestinian, but I think that's the only pressure inside Israel that can change something. So it's a bit narcissistic, you know, sometimes to just hang on to your, like if you're truly interested to stop something, so you need also to be pragmatical, if, if, even if you're a radical, you know, don't Do you want to hide your radical? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not. This hiding. is called this is called purity politics. Yeah, you know, I'm sure you saw that clip, very poignant clip of the hostage families basically busting into a Knesset meeting, and screaming at the politicians for five minutes straight. <clears throat> and by the way, if it had been a Jewish Voice for Peace group or something like that, they would have been chanting slogans all together. They didn't do that. They did something far more authentically Israeli, in my opinion. Yes, they I just all, it was just a cacophony. Everyone mm. was shouting their own monologue. It was amazing theater. It was completely Beautiful. riveting, you know, and yeah. they're screaming from their hearts and souls and guts, and they're calling them names and saying, how dare you? And, Whoever's close to this person is going to hear them, but it's totally ambient. It was beautiful music. The and role of art. <laughs> the role of art. But guess what they weren't shouting? You're murderers. You're killing the Palestinians. From the river to the yeah, sea, Palestine were. will be free. They weren't saying that. And it wouldn't have been as powerful if they had, because that's unintelligible, these people. These people can dismiss it. They cannot dismiss your murderers. You're gassing our hostages in the tunnels. You're bombing them from the sky. You're liars. You're keeping our country afraid. How dare you? We're Which going to take are. you down. Which they are. All of this is true. So do you want to, so are we then going to be saying like, oh, they're not radical enough? Yeah. No, these these are not political. They are political activists. They are. They are. Yeah, They're yeah. that that that's politics yes, applying pre <clears throat> applying pressure where it counts. Yes. Now, what I'm doing here on the outside is very different. Yeah. I'm doing my own kind of hasbara. You know, I'm doing my own kind of pushing back on theirs. I'm trying to awaken people out here 
to what's going on. I'm trying to encourage people out here to know you're not crazy. You know, I'm trying to keep morale up. I'm trying to amplify voices like yours and like Alon Lee's and like yeah. other Israelis and like Palestinians all over the world who, and that's my role to play. And, uh, and uh, you know, if you think of the fellowship of the ring, <laughs> you needed dwarves, you needed elves, you needed halflings, you needed wizards, you needed humans, you needed, you know, trees to talk, you know, like all of it. Yeah. So, so this leads me to, uh, to my next question, uh, Sensei. And, and the question is, <laughs> the question is... Da Daniel-san has become Mr. Miyagi. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, <laughs> uh, so my, my question is, so we, uh, you, you are Jewish Canadian, okay? Of Hungarian descent, right? And, and, uh, But I identify as a New Yorker. Yeah, exactly. And 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 also uh, second generation to the Holocaust, right? Uh -huh. As a person with this identity and your skill set and your situation in in life, you have a certain role which yeah. uh, you you started to describe, and we would like to hear more about. We are uh, uh, Israelis and Hebrew, like uh, whatever you want to define us, but we have a certain uh, uh, identity and a certain situation in life and certain skill sets. What and one of you is Mizrahi and the other one's Ashki, right? So you... Uh, uh, I'm, I'm pure Ashkenazi and you're yeah, mixed. Right? I'm mixed. I'm half and half. Mm -hmm. okay. what, what do you think? Okay. So we started doing stuff, okay? But we, we had a, a, a Zoom meeting uh, and, uh, and I wanted to show uh, Elik and, uh, and another friend who was on this meeting. Uh, they asked, okay, how, what do we need to do? How do we decide what we need to do? And I showed them the meme of the dog in the laboratory. And the caption is, I have no idea what I'm doing. Okay. So this is, so I have some idea now. More. We have some more idea about what, but maybe if you were uh, uh, our manager, <laughs> what would you tell us to do? Okay. And, and the, the criteria is that we Uh, uh, make the most impact on the longest scale, like this This is a marathon, we build something that on the scale of five to ten years would be would bring as much peace as possible to this area. Okay, great. Yeah. And, as much, and as much sanity. Yes, right? yes. Sanity for peace also. Yeah, peace for sanity and sanity for peace. It's, it, it's, it's the same. Well, I would say to you, and this may be a an unsatisfying answer, but I hope it'll actually be deeply satisfying once you kind of chew on it. Keep doing what you're doing, which is not to say keep doing the same actions, but keep being who you're being, mm. which is to say, how did you get here? On the basis of what did you start it? You started it on a hunch, an impulse, an idea. That's being creative. You followed that and you did the next thing, which is to have a conversation on camera. Maybe you had some conversations off camera first. You couldn't have had the conversation on camera until you'd had them off. Yeah. It Then was it was the time. Question. There the was fifth deep, deep conversation that Elik and I had. I was like, Elik, let's put the camera on and, 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 and record. Okay. It. Now, why did you do that? Because there was nothing left to say in private. Yeah. The conversation transforms the minute people are watching. Then you learn about that. Now, what are you guys building? The first thing you're building is a language to talk about this. We already spoke about you going back and speaking about it in Hebrew, but first you had to speak about it in English with an audience internationally that can hear you. The speaking is only ever as good as the listening is. So you have to be speaking into a listening because if you're speaking to a brick wall, you're not going to be able to even form the words. You've done that for a while. And now something in you says, okay, now let's bring this language, let's translate this back into the language we need it to resonate in. The language of the Hebrew man. <laughs> the language of the Hebrew Canaanites. Yeah. <laughs> From there, the next thing will present itself. And it's all aligned with the intention of peace and sanity. And you never know what the next thing is going to be. It's going to be improvised. At a certain point, you're going to bring in more and more people, right? You're doing it in a certain spirit, which is friendly, humble, inquisitive, curious. This is what I get from you guys. So it's who you're being, not what you're doing. The doing will come from just staying true to that.
if you do too much strategizing, it's like killing the golden goose, trying to get the result now, as opposed to incubating it, growing it, and you and letting the results be unpredictable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How did we meet? Because you guys spoke out, I saw it, I liked it, so on and so forth, you know, and whatever impact that had on your reach, I'm very glad. Um, that's how it works. Yeah. So I'd say if I was your manager, I would keep encouraging you to listen to your instinct, to notice for those moments where it starts to feel stagnant or you're getting tired of saying the same things. Well, what else? Who can we call in? What other conversations do we need to have? Let yourself be that dog in the laboratory who doesn't know what he's doing. That's the only place creativity comes from. It's like, mm -hmm. how do scientists make discoveries? Mm -hmm. They scratch their heads for a long time. They go, they stand on their head. They do something, they do something nonlinear. They let the answer come to them rather than trying to force the issue. And above all, don't sell out on your intention. Don't make it about people pleasing. Don't make it about clicks and likes. Um, that's a challenge for me. <clears throat> yeah, because I get so much um, positive feedback for what I do, mm -hmm. and I have a certain charisma that people like, and people have a parasocial relationship with me. Yeah, uh, that it can be kind of intoxicating. But now I'm basically flirting with the world rather than rather than just being. Yeah. And there and there may come a point very soon where the most aligned thing is to like not post so much, mm -hmm. to go get back into my art and in which case i'll do that so you know alignment has a certain feeling to it this is again my mental chiropractic work you can feel it when things are aligned and you can feel it when they're kind of not and that's when you're like riding the horse backwards and you got to turn around and ride the horse in the direction it actually wants to go but you're not the horse you're just the rider any other that questions help? for the sensei um I just wanted to, does that land? Does that, does yeah, that yeah, land? Yeah, this, this is, okay. So, so I would say this is basically what I thought. And uh, it's great, uh, great for me to hear you say it uh, much more uh, deeply and much more eloquently than I ever could. But this has been my, my, uh, my approach. And I think it's, it's very good to, because, because the situation is chaotic and we don't, and no one knows what to do. No one Correct. knows what to do. So we just need to be as uh, sensitive, as attentive as possible to what is going on around us and make decisions from, and also, also be connected to ourselves as much as possible. And I feel like this is happening more and more and more yeah. because the, the situation demands it. So connected to ourselves and, and sensitive to, and then make the decisions. Yeah. And how did you start this episode? Elik pulls out his violin, his fiddle, and plays us. Why the fuck did you do that? I don't know, because you wanted to, you, because that's you stayed connected want. to yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You stayed connected to yourself, and that's where the stuff is going to come from. You know, and this is where, and it, this is an art in a sense. Mm -hmm. You know, there's an art to being in the public eye and making a difference. Mm -hmm. Whether you're using art itself, staying connected to yourself, in a world that wants anything but that for you because yeah. this world does not profit off you being connected to yourself mm -hmm. my dad and i wrote about this in the myth of normal we're living in a society that is designed to disconnect people from them themselves so that they can better be exploited and so on and so forth and it has ruinous costs for our health and well-being it's the, the subversive thing is to stay connected to yourself that is so the most radical thing that. that you can do that is radical. And radical is not an aesthetic. It's not a vibe. It You, you don't advertise it, just like authenticity is, is not a brand. Mm -hmm. you know, radical is an action that will either be recognized as such or it won't. But it's not some club to join. Yeah, It's what do I need to do to stay human in an inhumane world? Yeah. And then you do, you do that. The, do you know the play... Uh... Um, rhinoceros of uh, yeah UNESCO. You know, so you know when I was uh, like in high school, I was in theater class, and I was the director, and I chose this play 
and I didn't know like suddenly oh whoa <laughs> Was Maybe so many tell, years ago. Tell, tell a little bit about this play to, to the viewers so they understand the, the yeah, context. It's, it's a kind of allegory to fascism, I think, that everybody turned into like gradually to rhinoceros. Yes. And yes. and there's one guy that he stays human and he doesn't understand what's going on. So I'm and I yeah, and I kind of feel like we're living through time like this. It's really weird. Like, okay, I so don't want to say I'm the only, yeah, there's a group of people and I'm really not the only, it's like it could be a bit narcissistic to say like, yeah, I'm the... No, but you might as well be. That's what it feels like. You're like it in a zombie movie. Like, like people are just yeah. around me. All my friends are starting to speak in a way that I've never heard them speak like before. And and it's really worrying. And I feel like this. What can I do? This is yeah. the the I, I see this play and I'm like, oh, this feels very real to me. So right. Well, you can watch you, know. the, you watch that play or go back and watch the Donald Sutherland horror movie uh Invasion of the Body Snatchers, where you know everyone okay. is gradually turning or a zombie movie, Shaun of the Dead yeah, or yeah. whatever. You know. I, but I would say, Alec, that there's a clue in what you said about what it would mean to stay connected with yourself. If you, as a high school student, chose Ionesco to direct, well, then one of the things that you've got going on is a sense of the absurd. Yeah, it's literally absurdist theater. Yeah. <clears throat> well, that's gonna t that tells me that suggests to me that your ability to heighten absurdity for people is a gift you have. And you also do it in your art. Yeah, you my do art it. is a lot about this. Yeah, and I also and think, I, I also think also that you. Would. Yeah. So, what I knew for a long time, and now I'm just experiencing by my own like creation, uh, is that fascism demands uh, satire and it demands uh, 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 ridicule. Like, like yeah. the only way as an artist to deal with fascism is to go to the absurd is to go to the uh, place of a uh, parody of, uh, of of satire like because it's so ridiculous like it's so inherently ridiculous fascism mm -hmm. that you that you 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 kind of have to play into it if you try well, it, to play it it will win <laughs> like, exactly it demands the very thing it outlaws yeah yeah, yeah exactly um so maybe I, I think maybe one last question and uh, then uh, we can uh, i just want to to finish on on a, maybe on a more, uh, like talking about the future, okay? And I mm -hmm. want to ask you, what do you think, like, let's say, will will uh, happen in, in the, the land between, between the river and the sea uh, uh, in like one year, five years, 10 years? And the deep question that I want to ask you is, are you optimistic? You know, I, I can't come up with a better answer than the one Chomsky gives anytime or or gave, because I don't know that we'll hear from him again. He's not doing so well health-wise. But, um, you know, people would always ask him that. And he'd say, that's up to us. He's not a prognosticator. <clears throat> and I think what he's suggesting is, like, what's the value in predicting? Either I'm right or I'm wrong. But if I'm right, well, me telling you what's going to happen can only make people complacent, because it's going to happen anyway. No, we got to make it happen. Mm -hmm. You know, we can have aspirations. Uh, and then work towards them. But, you know, what if it's someone had asked me on October 9th, 2022, what do you think the future is going to look like one year from today? How valuable would my prediction have been? Yeah. Now, maybe I would have had a prophetic sense that yeah. this is leading us to order. But in any case, who cares? Hmm. Um, Stephen Jenkinson, the writer I quoted earlier, also points out, just like it's not really the job of artists to express themselves, but rather to speak faithfully to the times and be a prism, that prophets, the prophetic tradition, is not about predicting the future. It's not about prognosticating. It's about standing firm in the moment and naming what you see and naming the consequences of it yes. and saying, this is a consequence of that, and that will be the consequence of this, mm -hmm. and not flinching. Now, that is not prediction. That is not soothsaying. That's, except in the sense of speaking truth, you know? Mm -hmm. So the future will be influenced by forces way beyond us and to the extent that we can affect them, let's do that. And then when people ask him about optimism, 
What's the exact phrase? He says, I'm a tactical pessimist and a strategic optimist. I like that a lot. You have to believe that something is possible, mm -hmm. even if it's not imminent. Yeah. And this is why I don't recommend hope. Mm. Because hope is contingent on a kind of attachment to a certain future outcome. And I can feel better about now because the good thing is coming. I don't want to feel better about now. But I also don't want to lose touch with what's possible now and if it's possible now then something else must be possible for the future that we can't see so what's possible now creativity more israelis waking up mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know more people watching my brene brown video and getting enlightened <laughs> i'm just kidding <laughs> no, uh, it's really good. solidarity and and you can look at what's already happened the other thing that's possible is palestinians finding their voice in the global conversation yes. for the and first time already. ever for yeah. the first time ever. Yes, it's amazing. Mm. Now, should we then be thankful for the genocide? It's a ridiculous question. No, no, it, it's happening. Yeah, it's just and what, what and what are the what are the beneficial possibilities that are emerging as a result? More of the same, more of people giving a platform to and, and valuing the voices of the people to whom this is happening. Uh, and who knows what that will lead to. So I am optimistic. I'm pessimistic. It's a question of putting those two things in the right place. So yeah, tactical pessimism in that it's probably likely to get worse before it gets better. Strategic optimism in that something is building. Yes. And we and, and there is sanity building. Now, either we're going to win the day or we're not. Either the earth will be destroyed by climate change or it won't. Yeah. It's not looking good. But we have to act as if, you know? Yeah, so this is what I call hope. Like saying there is a possibility of a future that is positive. So let us focus on that possibility and make it as as possible as possible. Maybe. Yeah, and let's... Yeah. I will share this... Exp the, 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 what, the oh, experience. right, right. Yeah, tell about this. Because yeah. we're close to the end, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We want to finish soon, so maybe this is a good... Yeah, because I had, it's interesting, like, you know, I had really interesting conversation with some Palestinian guy in Jerusalem uh, on the street. Like, I had a break, um, and we both, like, went, went to have a smoke, and then, and he approached me, and we started having a, a conversation, and I kind of asked him, what is the situation in uh He's from East Jerusalem. He's right? from East Jerusalem. Yeah. And he said, like, you know, it's it's normal. Like it's our normal. It's not normal. <laughs> but but uh but somehow we started talking about the, the world starting to wake up. And and I told him like that the world kind of and I shared with him the feeling of like frustration that I try to do. I write about because sometimes when I'm really depressed about what's going on, like I tell myself, you know, okay, so I felt helpless, so I decided to speak out, but nothing changed, you know, and sometimes it's really depressing. So and then like he leaned very close and he's like did to me like this, but you changed something here, and that's what matters, you know. And that's exactly what I was going to say. Yeah. You know, the, in the Jewish tradition, the rabbis say, when you save a life, you save the whole world. Mm -hmm. I'd say when you save a brain cell inside yourself, you save the whole world. I mean, yeah. when you when you wake up, you you are being enlightened you and you are being enlightenment and you're bringing more of that into the world. You're keeping that Hanukkah flame alive. Yeah. You know, and, and, and um, yeah. And so possibility lives now. It's not some future thing. And if I asked you guys this, if I told you that you will never see a one-state solution or a, Palest a free Palestine in your lifetime, but that you're laying the seeds for it. So oh, people, people, wonderful. Yes, yes. Right? In other words, your activism is not contingent on. It's not. Mm -hmm. You have to see it. In your lifetime, never mind this moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's just not it, you know. And the other Jewish phrase I love is, um, "The task is not yours to complete, but neither is it yours to refuse." Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Yeah. I mean, so your optimism about... or lack of it is whatever you need to keep yourself going, but it's ultimately yeah. not the point. And and take take and this is you know coming back to where we started. Take joy and comfort and solace and and refuge in in what the Buddha the Buddhists call the sangha, you know the community, the the relational perks of of not being alone in this world, even if you are alone. Um, Someone had to do that, Jim. Eventually, yeah, I, I I did the same thing with alone. Lee, it's just too easy. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, enjoy it. Yeah. Enjoy it, and and get sustenance from it, and get creativity from it. Resource yourself in it because it's all we have. Okay, uh, Eric, any closing remarks? Um, I don't know. It was. Really helpful. Thank you. Daniel, You're welcome. You... Thank, thank you for stepping into my dojo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you, Sensei. Uh, how did you do <laughs> exist, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so um, thank you, uh, all the viewers, for uh, uh, listening to this uh, first episode of uh, Yala. Thank you so much, Daniel, for uh, being uh, a, an amazing guest to start this off and uh, really insightful and and uh, deep and i learned a lot uh here i know and i hope yeah. our viewers did as well so yeah like i said like i said to you off air getting to have conversations like this i said things that i've never said in this conversation because you asked me questions that i've never asked that i've never been asked and you guys are different than anyone i've spoken to so it's a contribution to me as well, as well as hearing things from you guys that I'd never heard. Have new conversations. Yes. That's what you guys are doing. You're you're developing a new language to have new kinds of conversations. And the world is built on conversations. Zionism was a conversation yes. that was then turned into a material reality. We mm -hmm. can't build a world until we can we can't see it until we can say it. Mm -hmm. So let's keep saying it and finding new ways and new ways and new ways to say it. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Daniel. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye, Bye. Bye Leitraut.